and hello everyone. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So I will hopefully share a screen. And your timing, aren't you, Li Fei? So the first slide is going to take four seconds. It's really just hello, everyone. It's about rehabilitation being a right for everyone. But just really going backwards 12 years. Um, when I was diagnosed with dementia, it's the first time I experienced that sense of otherness that the late Dr. Martin Luther King talked about. Um, and I now understand from the inside out the harmful stigmas and discriminations faced by so many other marginalised groups. Um, I have a lot of resonance with Indigenous communities now that I certainly didn't have before. Um, and I guess it's that sense of otherness or unjustness that hopefully keeps me going. I had a bit of a chat earlier to Lee Fay today saying I'm kind of, I'm tired, Jim, and I want to go home. But anyway, I'm, I am home. So thanks to COVID, we're all home. So just going back on rights, um, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights uh, came out in 1948, which is a long time ago. And it is meant to protect every single member of civil society, including you, including me, including all people with dementia, all older persons, um, whether they have disabilities or not. It's meant to protect everybody. And I think that certainly in Australia, the Royal Commission is proving that the rights of many older per persons and even younger persons living in residential aged care here, their rights have been very seriously violated. So it is time that we all talked about a rights-based approach to uh, dementia and to ageing in general. So 67 years after um, the UN declaration, the OECD put out a report addressing dementia, the OECD response, that was in 2015. And the conclusion in that report was that dementia receives the worst care in the developed world. So that's one of our country is in the developed world. So that's a pretty sobering thought. Um, in 2016, the Australian Clinical Practice Guidelines and uh, Principles of Care for People with Dementia um, were launched and I had spent some time involved in an advisory group on those guidelines. And I felt that that might be hope for change um, but from my perspective, it wasn't a lot of hope. There's only one recommendation in there that actively refers to rehabilitation. And it doesn't really refer to the rehabilitation that, that I want and that I think we all need and deserve. So I was a bit disappointed by those guidelines, but they're a start. So the current medical model of care, which is what I received when I was diagnosed, which was, you know, a difficult diagnosis. Um, it is the most feared disease now of the over 65 age group. But the only change to this pathway of post-diagnostic support that I received 12 years ago, the only change to that since the OECD report and since the clinical guidelines came out that I can see is that palliative care is now often offered more often, but even then it's usually only offered nearer the end of life. Whereas if uh, we were diagnosed with a terminal cancer or motor neuron disease or some other critical illness, um, usually palliative care is, is offered much earlier, uh, soon after the diagnosis in fact, so that you and your family um, have support all the way through. And that doesn't happen yet for people with dementia. So in 2020, little has changed. People with dementia are still mostly at the time of diagnosis or soon after, told to go home and prepare their end of life affairs. And that there really is nothing you or we can, we can do. And even though the clinical guidelines do have uh, uh, some points on um, you know, healthy lifestyle and exercising, I've not yet met a person with dementia who has given that advice post-diagnosis. We're not yet offered proactively disability support or assessment, nor rehabilitation. Um, 
and that's essential for us to maintain um, independence for longer. So disability assessment and support and rehabilitation is not a cure for anything, but it is a pathway to having independence for longer and a much higher quality of life. And still often it, the about us without us is still around and tokenistic inclusion is still quite rough. Um, so that's something else uh, that we need to think about. So dementia as a disability, and you know, it's been on the WHO's website for a number of years now. It used to say that dementia was the leading cause of disability and dependency among older persons. And for the last couple of years, it's said the, is one of the major causes of disability and dependency among older persons. And that therefore means that um, as a person with acquired disabilities, I must have the same access to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or the CRPD as anybody else. Uh, and the CRP adopts a social model of disability. It doesn't, uh, uh, the dis disability community doesn't rely on a medical model of care, it relies on a social model of disability. Um, and I think that that's an important uh, step in ensuring that people with dementia um, not only have access to uh, having their rights upheld, but to uh, proper disability support, including rehabilitation. Just a little bit of disability data, there's an estimated, and this is from 2019, so it's probably up now, an estimated billion people living with disabilities globally. Um, 4.4 4 million in Australia, um, but dementia is not yet included in that data. So that needs to be one day updated. In America, there's one in four Americans live with a disability. Um, disability affects women um, who are already disadvantaged through exclusion and gender discrimination. And women and girls with disabilities are particularly vulnerable to abuse. Um, and people with disabilities across the board often don't receive um, healthcare appropriate healthcare or adequate healthcare. So there's a lot to be thinking about when we think about dementia and disability. And even though dementia is not yet well recognized as a condition uh, causing disability, it certainly fits into uh, the disadvantage of other disabled persons. So by reframing dementia, uh, as a disability, we can reinforce the rights for all people with dementia um, as described in the UN Convention. And this approach also gives us, from my perspective, the most hope of people accessing rehabilitation. And I mean rehabilitation beyond support for continence management and activities of daily living, which seem to be what um, the medical model of care for dementia uh, indicates we mostly need, you know, how to make a cup of tea, uh, to manage continence and, and other activities of daily living. Um, for me and for many people I know with dementia, they want rehabilitation that enables them to get back to living, uh, and to living the life that they want to live, um, whether that's work, whether that's study, whether that's volunteering in their community, but to live a full life with meaning to them. So I've been going to, not this year, obviously, thanks to COVID, but um, I've attended the last couple of uh, Rehabilitation 2030 uh, meetings in Geneva, uh, and there's been a significant call for action there. And I think we need a 21st century approach to dementia. Um, there was a wonderful quote from uh, a doctor uh, at the forum in Geneva last year, a medical doctor who's in the Ministry of Health, and he his first slide said that he, he, I keep the patients alive, rehabilitation gives them quality of life. And, uh, you know, there are members here tonight in the Zoom room um, who I know are using rehabilitation and uh, exercise to, to give them a much higher quality of life. And certainly I've been doing that. Bless my mouse. So why has rehabilitation been denied to people for so long? That's something I've been asking myself for nearly 10 years. 
I think that it's partly due to stigma and to discrimination and to ageist attitudes and, and ageism in general. And even though uh, there are younger people with dementia, it's 27 or 8,000 in Australia, um, because we've got what's commonly seen as an older person's disease, we also are impacted by ageist attitudes because of the condition that we are diagnosed with. Um, I've seen a persistent refusal by many to accept that dementia is a condition causing cognitive and other disabilities and uh, a lack of willingness to recognise a rights-based approach. I think that we're plagued with 20th, 20th century attitudes and behaviours um, towards people with dementia. Um, there are misperceptions, there is ignorance, um, there are myths about our remaining capacity, um, myths about how much agency we still have, and certainly about our remaining abilities. Um, I think that sometimes the, uh, the big stuff, the power and the funding gets in the way of change um, and I think there's also been an unwillingness until quite recently of experts to change their position on the issue of rehabilitation and dementia um, and you know I, the other old uh, always gets in the way of everything is egos and, and you know there are corporate egos organizational and maybe academic and individual egos can get in the way of real change because if you've been uh, promoting one way for a long time and you still believe it's the right way, it's very hard to change. Um, I think that's the gift of having dementia as you learn to change uh, on a daily basis. So I, I, when I was involved in a research project with Dr Linda Steele and um, Professor uh, Lynn Phillipson and Richard Fleming uh, on the rights of residential, uh, people in residential care, um, I, I did a list of just a few of the violations of my rights since being diagnosed with dementia. And I think that it hasn't got worse since COVID, but the COVID pandemic has certainly uh, highlighted that to the rest of the world, um, just what happens to people in, particularly in nursing homes or residential aged care. So there's been a denial of, of universal health coverage and I won't read them out, you can see the various articles of the CRPD that are impacted by that. Um, I've had a denial of equal inclusion and social participation. Um, and often I've had to self fund to, to participate in things that other people are funded to attend. Um, there's been a denial of employment and of reasonable accommodations. For me, I was 49 when I was diagnosed and uh, lost my job because of uh, disclosing I had dementia. Um, and if we see dementia as a disability, then employers and others will start to see that it that they have a legal obligation to provide reasonable accom accommodations. So there's a number of CRPD, B, CRPD articles that are impacted there. Um, absolute denial of rehabilitation. Uh, and had I not been proactive about that myself and uh, been able to fund my own rehabilitation, um, I don't think I'd be anywhere uh, near as functional as I am now. Um, so, you know, I could go on with the list of violations of my rights, but we need to think about the 459,000 other people in Australia with dementia and the more than 50 million people with dementia globally um, because it, it's affecting every single one of us and it's affecting every single person who's diagnosed. Uh, you know, there's a new diagnosis every 3.2 seconds. So somewhere in the world, someone with dementia who's being newly diagnosed is having their rights violated. Um, and that's a serious uh, issue for all of us we're all responsible there are some hey, i'm sorry yeah. to interrupt Possibly you the outcomes that's my last slide Thanks. reduction of the human cost of dementia um improved quality of life uh, and so on thanks lee Fay. sorry thank you kate I, I didn't want to interrupt you um because i think you said some really important and thoughtful things 
Um, and I've written down rehabilitation means help to to um, to live a full life 